Uh, some people do, some people don't. Good morning, everybody. I hope you're all well. Um, my name is Nigel Payne. Um, greetings from Slovakia, where it's a nice and sunny day. And today I will be mainly building a uh, Slovakian or Zelznica Spolotnost Slovensko um, four wheel rail car. It is a kit from um, a company called Jan Sekul in the Czech Republic. And it's more of a, a set of parts, really. It needs quite a lot of work. Um, I built one, which you can see hopefully in the background. No, you can't, because I'll bring it down to you. Here's what I prepared earlier. Um, this is under construction. And uh, today I'm starting from a basic sheet of metal. Um, this prototype was built in the 1970s by a company called Studenka in the Czech Republic. Um, excuse me a second, I have a noisy cat. Ge gentlemen, good morning. While Nigel um, quickly sorts out the, uh, the feline uh, family at his house, uh, I'd just like to wish you all a good morning. Um, just so you're all aware, uh, these record these live demonstrations are being recorded. At the same time, all participants will be muted. So that just makes sure we don't have extraneous background noise. If anybody wants to put any questions to Nigel during the demonstration, at the bottom of your screens, if you move your cursor or mouse to the bottom of the screen, there is a chat facility. So via the chat facility, you can actually post messages and at certain times during the demonstration, either myself or Dave Smith, who is my co-host for this session with Nigel, will then put questions to him that have been raised. Hopefully everyone is looking at a, uh, a view where you can see Nigel full screen. If you can't see Nigel full screen, move your cursor to the top right of the screen where a view icon is displayed. Click on the icon and select speaker view. So back over to Nigel. I thank you. I do apologize. I think that was part of the spiel that was meant to happen <laughs> right at the beginning. So I've copped up right from the very start. Um, so I've just Google translated a, uh, a short piece about these rail cars. Just so you know, um, they were built to replace um, some older rail cars uh, obviously, um, of the M131 class. Um, and these were originally given the designation M152. In modern parlance, it's a class 810 rail car. Um, they were manufactured in 1973, or started manufacturing in 1973. There were quite a lot of these, uh, these, these built. Um, and of course, these things were designed to run on secondary lines. If you remember the Pacer units, it's of the same ilk. It's a badum, 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 four wheeled affair. They still run. Uh, Kezmarok, where I live in Slovakia, um, they, they're currently running them up and down the branch line uh, with, a, with a trailer, which looks exactly the same as this, but, but with, the, uh, uh, with the motor taken out, the, uh, the engine taken out. Um, so, they have a six cylinder Liage ML634 horizontal diesel engine and a automatic, I think that should be Hydra. It says Hnadro, but it's Hydro mechanical gearbox um, taken from um, a bus, a bus design. Um, and of course, there's cooling um, built in. It's all of constructed from light welded steel, as you can see, this is brass. Um, 
Uh, the wheel sets are suspended by coil steel springs and guided by steel mandrels. Um, because of the, the fact that it is quite a long wheelbase, I'm very conscious of the fact that these things uh, going around a model railway or a garden railway, as I'm hoping to have, um, will be a bit of a will be a bit of a problem. If I switch cameras, <laughs> let's see if this does actually work. Wow. Uh, you might be able to see that we have here a, a motor gearbox unit and I have sprunged it. This is totally scratch built uh, affair. The original version um, doesn't have any castings in the kit whatsoever. So what uh, I decided to do was uh, with the with the uh, where they're laminating pieces to recreate S special effects like springs, which you can see on this one, it's just laminated. Well, hopefully that's clear enough for you. Um, I have actually inserted some proper spring springing in there. It took two weeks to make them because <laughs> I've got uh, two of these. Well, this is the second one, but I've got two of these to build. And um, I've got a lovely kit of parts here, which, which have come off this kit. Most of which will be, not be required. So here's the original, the new assembly. This will come out, come on. So it's a very, all this has been, you can see that clearly, all this has been scratch built from a solid piece of uh, nickel silver that I bought from the Worth Valley Railway. I bought a whole batch of it um, from the Worth Valley Railway about hmm, 25 years ago when I lived in Keithley. And uh, I've, I'm still using these bits of brass so uh, and nickel silver. So out of this, I've, uh, I've um, machined up a, uh, a spring unit, drilled it and designed it so this all telescopes together. The outer part of the telescope is a bit of k &S tubing. We all know that quite well, I'm sure. The inner bit, because um, I live in Slovakia, you don't have k &S here. So it was a bit difficult to get hold of. So I actually spun it up on the lathe um, to get it to the right diameter. And worse still, I had to drill a hole right way down the middle of it. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, that took a good afternoon's work as well. Um, but, um, but yeah, it, it all works okay. Um, you can probably see here, if I zoom in, maybe this will work. You'll go out of focus, but you'll come back into focus any second. If I go the right way. There we go. That's about right, isn't it? Is that focused? You can see the, uh, the springing, the springs here. Uh, there's a M12, um, sorry, not an M12, that's bloody big, isn't it? It's a 12BA uh, set screw going through the middle and at the bottom there is a little, there is a little uh, nut which retains it all. I have a etched overlay, which one of these bits here will have it. But there's an etched overlay which will go over this and attached to it will be a shock absorber which will just be uh, um, a uh, it won't be working i think that's enough to make it work just boing 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 um i'm driving on one axle um with plenty of weight you can see a plug for the motor manufacturer <laughs> um i chose this motor because it's got a nice big gear on the bottom there it actually fits it's about one millimeter radius narrower than the the uh the tread of the wheel not the flange the tread so it will run on the railway line and i've actually tested this over some point work where is it gone i've tested over some point work and it works uh, perfectly well um so we know that it will go um like I said, I'm only fitting one motor. Um, 
because it is only it is only a four wheeled rail car, uh, and there will be two of them permanently coupled together when I'm running it. So uh, the hope, what I hope, is that there will be enough weight there to uh, to get it to uh, adhere to the track. There's, let's go back to the big screen, eh? There's loads of room inside here. There's a big hole in this one, which will, which will soon be filled in. Um, but there's loads of room inside here, so I probably will get some uh, nice cast OEH figures and sit them right next to the motor, so it should, it should uh, help with the traction. Um, but we'll see, we'll see how it goes. So this is today's project. Um, I will be mainly starting with a, uh, the chassis. I'm going to work on the chassis this morning and uh, hopefully this afternoon I, I can progress to the body, but the chassis is the idea. Um, I guess while I'm talking all this time, I'm not getting anything done, but um, that's the way it is. Incidentally, um, if anybody wants to uh, ask any questions, uh, I know you, you can't speak to me, but you can send me a chat message, which uh, um, if I get plenty of questions after about 20 minutes of work, um, I will stop and uh, I can answer any questions. So uh, please feel free to uh, ask away. Um, Colour, well, it's typical modelling. A flux has already fallen over, but luckily it had the lid on. Um, so that was my worst fear, which has already come to life. <laughs> um, okay, so to proceed this morning, um, while I was waiting to, to start everything, I decided that I would um, do the hard bit or the or the, the muscular bit and cut out uh, a, uh, a floor for this unit. I decided, um, having built the first one, that I should actually build a proper floor for this. Uh, first reason is it will be stronger. Second reason, um, uh, it it won't. Uh, it'll help stop the chassis from warping. And mainly, the other the other thing is. is that because there's so much room for detail in this model and, and I can go and have a look at the units just up the road here, I will be able to add some interior detail. Um, it is my hope that, uh, that I will follow this up today with a article in the Gazette. Um, never done an article for the Gazette, so we'll see. I'll do an article for the Gazette to follow this up so that people that have joined us today Thank you. Um, we'll be able to see some, uh, um, see what came of my efforts this morning. Um, so, I think without further ado, I should start in metal. What do you think? has been marked out so I do know a little bit what I'm doing. Can you see? Do you want to see closer? Give me a thumbs up or something if you do. You want to see closer, okay. I better. Let's have a look. Ah. It's file time. What I have here is uh, a sheet of nickel silver. If anybody actually uh, works with metal uh, and builds kits, I really, really like nickel silver as a modeling medium. I'm not a, a huge fan of brass, but of course, beggars can't be choosers. Um, and in this case, this is this is a brass uh, this is a brass kit. Brass, uh, I find harder to solder. That's that's the basic thing. Nickel silver is a bit softer. I don't know. Um, uh, one of our hosts today, Dave Smith, will know a little bit more about metal than me. But um, uh, I find nickel silver a lot easier to work with. So, there we go. Get 
to make sure that it's nice and straight. So the challenges with this whole event has been setting up the cameras. Uh, I sell cameras for a living. That isn't a plug for my business, but I do understand a little bit about it. But when I first set them up, I set them off my modeling bench. So when I started to <laughs> saw and file, is the whole picture was shaking all over the place. It wasn't very nice for, for me to watch. If you watched it for any length of time, you'd probably feel seasick. While you're doing that, Nigel, uh, I'd just like to welcome all those participants who have joined us in the last five or ten minutes. Uh, good morning to you all and thank you for joining the Gage or Guild virtual show. Um, just so everyone is aware, um, all participants are muted when joining and remain muted. That's just so we can make sure that the background noise is kept to a minimum while Nigel is demonstrating. Um, this live demonstration is also being recorded and will be available to view for 14 days on the Guild website after the event. Um, everyone hopefully will be able to see Nigel full screen on their um, electronic device. If not, you need to go to the top right of the screen where there is a view icon and you need to select speaker view. Once again, thank you all for joining us and back to Nigel. Oh, I thank you very much. It was like the uh, commercial break. It was quite nice. I didn't have to talk. <laughs> well, that was a model, which I, I presume all of you will do. Model building and talking at the same time is bloody difficult. Uh, I spoke to Jackie Nisha last week in a, in a meeting. And, uh, and I said to Jackie, says, can, can you pass across some of your feminine side to me? And she sort of looked at me very bemused. And I said, uh, and she sort of, why? And, she, and I said, well, I need to be able to multitask. It ain't easy. Modeling tends to be a bit of a solitary practice, especially now these days with the old corona thing going off. Um, in the past six months I've been stuck at home. I haven't been to the UK since March the 11th when I was meant to be attending a, a, a big trade show and it got cancelled. So I flew back to Slovakia where my family live and uh, I've been there ever since. So in that time, I decided, right, well, you've got to get something positive out of this whole debacle. And I decided that I'd get back and really knuckle down and get some of these models that I'd started finished. You've all got them. You've got that status wagon in the back of the cupboard, which you hadn't got quite right or whatever. And, um, and I decided that, right, well, what I really must do is to get on and, um, and get this... Uh, Get this, these models finished. So I'll put you back onto full screen again. How's that? That's a bit better. Hello. Um, so what I decided is that I'd knuckle down and, and get some modeling done. So as a slight digression, I'll, I'll move this up. Um, you can probably see in the background a uh, brass four, uh, 444. That's a DJH. Um, uh, D class. I don't know what it is in, in LNER. I think it's an H1. It's a Northeastern Railway D class, which I built since, since March. Uh, I finished just before the, uh, the lockdown, I finished a, um, a Northeastern Railway F class, which is a 440 compound, which, uh, which is the green one up in the top corner up here, which has been very kindly painted by one of our professional friends. I could never line like that. I couldn't do it. Um, so I finished that. The model of rocket, that's that yellow thing, which is a little bit fuzzy in your picture. Um, that is, um, uh, that was completed last year and I painted it since March. And 
to the left of Rocket are a pile of um, wagons and horse boxes, uh, six wagons and two DNS horse boxes, which I've completed. Um, and they've all been uh, all been built since March. So I think I'm doing all right. <laughs> um, I'm just looking at the screen here. Um, hello from Winchester, Philip Morgan. Um, yeah, um, I know why. I, I recognise your name when you came onto the screen just now um, when we started. Um, this is the organiser of the Winchester Continental O-Gage event, uh, an American. I think that's right. Um, I've visited once. It's very, very good. Um, but uh, I was looking forward to going this year, but of course it's been cancelled. But I'm sure Philip will be watching this because he wants to see uh, something continental being built um, on, a, on a live demo. Well, hopefully I'm going to do it justice. Um, the idea for today is to try and at least have a chassis completed. I don't know whether we'll have the wheels uh, mounted onto it because I've already covered the springy springy thing um, but I can cover that again in a bit. Um, it isn't the easiest of things to assemble and it probably will involve a bit of jiggery pokery to get it right but we'll see. So the metalwork has been has been cleaned. The fiberglass brush will be run around the edge so that I can make sure that I can tin this up properly. I shall switch on the iron, otherwise we'll be sat there waiting forever. And uh, hopefully if we can get this soldered onto the first bit. So I'm assembling a kit and the first thing I'm doing is adding something that shouldn't really be there. So that's the way it goes. Well, whilst, whilst your iron is um, warming up, Nigel, yes, um, can everybody see me, by the way? Thumbs raise, up if you can see Raise me. your hand if you can see me. Right. I better introduce myself. My name's Dave Smith. <coughs> Excuse me. I should have been the host this morning, first thing. But thanks, thanks very much to Ian for stepping in literally at the last second to take over the hosting of this session. Would you believe it, but at 10.30, my laptop started to shut down because good old Windows decided to do an upgrade. At 10.30 on a Saturday morning, possibly the most important event of the year. <laughs> anyway, I'm here and I shall be um, taking over from Ian when, he's, when, he, when he wants to go for a drink or whatever. Um, I don't know whether Ian mentioned to you on his introduction, but... These sessions are being recorded and will be available to view on the Guild website, at, uh, well, from today onwards, presumably. Um, if, you if you don't want your picture to be uh, visible on the screen, you have the ability to um, uh, cancel the videoing by clicking the little icon down the bottom where it says stop video. And I noticed that quite a few of you have already done that. Anyway, I'll uh, hand, you, hand you back to... Um, to Nigel, who's busily fettling away there and um, wrestling with a piece of nickel silver by the looks of it. Yeah, I don't know where I bought this from. I think it was from a guy in the uh, Kettering area of, uh, of Northamptonshire a few years ago. Um, I'm not, I'm saying nothing. Don't, I never said you should. <laughs> Can you see that? I filled in the hole. So I discover that I shouldn't have done that, and um, and I've rightly screwed myself. Um, having ha built one earlier, I know that it would be right. Um, the um, the reason why I'm filling this is, uh, as I said, to give it a bit of strength, and so I can put internal detail in. Should I wish, I probably will do um, at a later date. Um, but for now, I'm going to do that. Uh, obviously, you've got to put a motor in here, so I will have to cut, cut a hole in this. But a good old uh, 
Dremel or, or disc cutter of some description will, will, will make that work quite quickly and easily. Um, so for now, we'll, we'll try and get this done. So, put the flux somewhere where you're not going to knock it over. I know everybody's going to come back and say, oh, well, yeah, but you should have used one of these great big flat things and keep it so it doesn't fall over and all the rest of it. But yeah, we all have intentions. Um, a lot of my time with modeling, I decided that, well, I want to get on and build um, rather than making things nice and pretty. So we'll see. Um, I have with me here a nice soldering iron bought from a booth, uh, well-known uh, purveyor of tools. I think that's right, isn't it, Squire? Um, a few years ago, and it's a um, temperature control soldering iron. And it's probably one of the best tools I bought, other than my old faithful um, resistance iron, which I've got here. Um, so I will do some resistance soldering later on today. So it should be a um, uh, something for you to see. Um, I like resistance soldering. I find it very clean way of soldering and joining pieces of metal together. Um, I really do like resistance soldering. Um, this one was is probably about twenty. Can you see that? Look at that soldering going on. Um, it was built about bought about 25, 30 years ago. Um, and it's served me very, very well indeed. Nigel, Ian has just asked the question, do you prefer liquid flux to the paste version, like uh, power flux? Good question. I prefer liquid. Um, yeah, I do. I prefer liquid flux. Um, probably because I've been brought up on it. Um, not drinking it, that is. <laughs> I, um, my history, because I'm speaking to you here from Slovakia, is, um, I'm, and I'm, I'm sure that there's probably some people from, from, the, from the group come to annoy me today. Um, my history is um, I joined a model railway club in the lovely town of Keefley, in Yorkshire, um, many, many, many moons ago, when I lived there, um, nineteen seven. When was a very hot summer? Is it seventy six or seventy seven? Seventy six. Seventy six. There we go. So in nineteen seventy six, I, my parents decided that we'd move to Keithley, and I went to a school called Hartington. It's twelve hours. Do you know I was going to switch that off? Well, do it now then. Bloody thing. That is so annoying. That was all I was going to do. And I don't know how to switch it off. Oh, God. Now, this is going to be too complicated for me. While you're fiddling with that, uh, and I'm, not you're... Going to, I'm, not, I'm not going to fiddle with it. Because it will only do it one more time and I'll have lunch and I'll, fi I'll fix it afterwards. Carry on, Dave. For what it's worth, um, I've, my experience with liquid flux in the past, and that's using this, um, or what it is, some, something acid, I can't remember what it Phosphoric. is. Phosphoric. Phosphoric. Acid, acid, yeah. One of the downsides of using that is that it gives off fumes, which if you have anything ferrous on your workbench, like, you know, spoons made of steel or anything iron, and they rust, Within within minutes, yeah, it's deadly stuff in that respect. I mean, the rust soon wipes off. It's only like a very surface, you know, surface rust. But um, that was one of the an, you know, annoying features I find um, of using liquid flux. I think you've got to work faster and use all your tools. <laughs> but another another advantage of, of the flux paste is if you've got very small components, you can literally stick them together with the flux, and they'll hold themselves in position whilst you apply the, um, the iron. So I think there's something to be said for both, uh, both types of flux, really. I, I think I agree with you there. Um, 
I have got some paste somewhere. I'm trying to think where it is. I, I might have to resurrect, resurrect that. Do you know, I'm just going to go back to the old modeling bench again. I cleaned, cleared this whole area yesterday and this modeling bench, it was spotless, right? You all know about modeling. <laughs> Everybody models within about a six inch by six inch area and all the rest of it is covered in drills, which I'm not using, but not yet. Steel rule, didn't need that anymore. Cut side cutters, which have got a nice little uh, layer of rust on now, apparently. A bit of meteorite that was given to me by my son this morning. It's not, it's a stone off Mount Crivan, which is um, about five miles away from where I live. Um, so I'm going to tidy all this muck up and then we can get on and we can do a bit of resistance soldering. Um, so going back to my plug for the Keithy Model Railway Group, Keithy Model Railway Club, I joined the Keithy Model Railway Club in 1977, um, having discovered that my running right past my school was a railway line which is the bottom of, under the Sackville Carlisle, of course, Keithley being en route to Skipton and the and north. And uh, that's how I got sort of really interested in railways. Um, and that, that's, that, that's what started me off. You know, I'm talking and I'm going to solder this on the wrong side. There you go. Turn it over. Um, so I joined Keithley Model Railway Club. And my father was a TT modeler. So another model of scale. Um, I'm not saying that, that double O isn't a model of scale, but, uh, the, the, but in those days there was plenty of proprietary stuff. Um, and uh, I came across this group of reprobates who had this massive N-gauge layout called Wharfdale Junction. You might remember it if, if, if you're of, that, of a certain age. It was a huge N-gauge layout. Um, which incorporated a model of Wharfdale viaduct and had a four track main line going around it. It was massive. And Robin Taylor and, uh, and co who were um, working on that layout uh, decided to upscale and go to O gauge. And they sort of dragged me in and I went downstairs and I was the junior member of the group, the junior member. I now live in Slovakia and of <clears throat> years old, but um, just one above a class, a, a, a Deltic, you can say that, you can work it out from there. And, um, and I became a junior member and I started modeling in, in O gauge. Of course, when you're 19, 13, 14 years old, you don't have any money. And then you've got all these wage earners who are going around the place, buying stuff left, right and center. So I begged, borrowed and stole what I could and um, uh, I sort of built a couple of Slater's wagons and everything. But we produced a model railway called Leeds Road, um, uh, which I was pleased to be involved with. And then a bit later on, we built a northeastern railway layout called Ravensbeck. Uh, and you probably will all know Ravensbeck. It's a big tail chaser and it's still around to, these, to this day. Um, and um, yeah, I've been involved in that group ever since. So my main thing is uh, really is not building uh, Slovakian or Czechoslovakian era uh, diesel rail cars, but actually doing Northeastern. Um, so um, this is a bit of a, a break for me. The main reason why I'm building this is because every year uh, in uh, Poprad, which is about 15 miles away from where we live, there is a big model show. And I complained to them last year saying, you haven't got enough model railway stuff. I didn't have any. Um, and I, I said, I'll, I'll bring something along. And I showed them what I was doing. And they said, oh, that's good. Did you do any North, any Slovakian? <laughs> so I'm building this for the show for next year. Um, Nigel. Oh, yes, sir, carry on. In the, in the absence of any other questions being asked, can I ask something else? Um, I noticed you're using resistance soldering um, 
Iron. Apparatus. Now, yes. the surface of your, let's call it work table, is presumably aluminium foil, is it? Right, yes. that's a good point. I, I was uh, finishing. I'm, pres I'm, I'm presuming that the reason for that is so that you don't solder to it. If it were, if it were any other metal, um, if, if it were brass, for example, which is equally conductive, um, yeah. there's a danger that you could solder to the actual work table, which of course you don't want to do. So, um, yeah, we've got a plastic here, which is just your normal modelling modeling bench type uh, plastic sheeting. Um, for resistant soldering iron, you need, soldering, you need to make a circuit. So I'm not going to put the camera down here because you don't want to see between my legs. Um, but I have a, um, a little unit which has got a transformer in it. It takes mains power. And um, the whole idea of it is that you make an electrical circuit. And oh, let's show me just go for the small screen again. Let's try that again. Ah, no, no, we won't do that because I switch it off. Save the battery. Right, we'll come back on again onto this here. Um, there's a little point here, and this is a carbon rod, and I think it's used in the in industry for. It's a it's a cutting device, I think. Is that right? Do you know, David? I know very little about. No. So it's, it's, it's a carbon rod with a with a um, with a metal coating, which I think is copper, which is also which is conductive. Um, carbon conducts electricity. Um, so the whole idea of this is that you make a circuit. The fact that there's a little point on there is that's a point of resistance. Hence the term resistance soldering iron. And what happens with this point when you make an electrical circuit is it gets hot, um, but it only gets hot in a very concentrated point. Um, also under here, I have got a, through the transformer, there is a button which, uh, which, you, which you use because you need your hands for other things. So why not multitask? You, you've got, you, you've got, you can press a button with your foot and there's also a three position um, switch which just gives which just outputs different uh, uh, volts, volts, amps, I don't know which way it is. I should have done, paid more attention at physics at school. Um, but current. you can control it. Current, that's current. the word. It'll be current. current. Yeah, current. So um, by varying that, you can vary the amount of heat that you put through. Um, I actually can solder white metal with these, with this. Um, and the technique is uh, assuming that this is uh, this is white metal. Is you hold it, <laughs> and when it gets too hot to hold, you, you know that it's that it's hot enough. <laughs> um, but Heath Robinson, I don't do that all the time, I must say. But that's one that's one way of doing it. Um, so why have I got a sheet of wood? This is this is this is the original piece that came from Mignon Model Supplies all those years ago. It's a piece of wood with a screw through it and a bloody big repair washer. Uh, and the idea is that you coat it or you cover it with a bit of tin foil. Um, we normally use turkey foil because it's really thick and quite good, but it's not Christmas yet, is it? If we have Christmas this year. So I'm just using standard uh, tin foil and I've wrapped it around this piece of, uh, of wood and taped it in place so it doesn't go anywhere. Um, people have criticised this and said, oh, it's all wrinkly. Well, it's a bit like me. Um, so it's all wrinkly and it's on there. And the point, reason why I like this way of doing it is because wood uh, is an insulator, so it doesn't conduct the heat away. So all of the heat and all of the current and everything is going through this tin foil down here and onto this whacking great big crocodile clip. This crocodile clip is the is the negative. All my cables are tangled up here. It's the negative that returns back down to the resistant soldering unit. So if I make a circuit, um, you might be able to see some sparks coming off here. Make a circuit and um, um, there you are, you've got the power. Touching it now, there's no, there's nothing because I'm not pressing down on the button. So now I, I'm making a circuit. So I have seen 
uh, somebody really good modeler. I've seen his work and everything. And he bought a resistance soldering unit and it had a steel base and he was using magnets to hold everything in place. Now I get the magnet thing. That's a really good idea. But surely a great big slab of steel is going to conduct all the heat away. Your comments on, in chat, please. You tell me. Um, I don't own one, but that's my theory. Um, maybe they use a huge amount more current to uh, to make it to make it happen. I don't know. Um, yeah. but it seems to be a very inefficient way of soldering. All the heat gets dragged away. It's like when you're soldering your boiler on your model railway loco, and you you've got a copper tube, and you've got to heat the whole tube up before it actually sticks, um, and before the, the solder starts melting. Uh, uh, Nigel, just right. looking, just looking, <clears throat> looking at the questions again. Now, Phil has made the comment that just going back to we were talking about liquid uh, liquid flow flux. He's made the comment that phosphoric acid is used in proprietary rust removers. Are we sure that it is actually phosphoric acid flux that's used uh, as a soldering flux? Yeah. Anybody know any different? Okay. Yes, Dave. Um, I've had a quick online search for that. Most of the proprietary fluxes that we use in modelling do contain phosphoric acid but at about 9% concentrate. Um, more, well, let's just say stronger fluxes that are available uh, usually contain um, hydrochloric acid, zinc chloride, and ammonium chloride for inorganic acid fluxes. Um, the other type of flux that we're familiar with, of course, is rosin flux, which is normally contained within cord solder. Yep. Right. Thanks, thanks for that, Ian. No problem. It's quite good, this, isn't it? We've got all the big, well, say discussion between the three of us, but uh, our viewers can send us a chat message. So please get involved. Um, I'm soldering using resistance soldering. Um, so, so far, so good. When it has all, when I've got it all in place, we can discuss a little bit about uh, the benefits of this. Um, one of the things about so, about the flux, of course, is that um, it's keeping the model clean. Um, so what I normally do with this is, uh, when the wife's not looking, I uh, sneak into the kitchen and I sh and I shove the model into the dishwasher and uh, it gets a, gets a rinse with the plates. Sometimes I get told off. Um, I also use that method when I'm, um, when I'm getting a model ready for painting. Um, I find that if you whap it through the dishwasher, it cleans everything off. Um, of course, I'm talking about metal models here. Um, I don't, a bit I'm sure about plastic, but I don't do a huge amount of plastic building. Um, but it cleans everything off. But when you've done it, you should always check the filter at the bottom of the dishwasher because you never know, you might find some precious little bits that have, you haven't soldered very well, which have fallen off. N Nigel, to me again. Yes, you. This may be a silly question, but that, you're, you're constructing the floor of the vehicle, yeah? Yes. Which started off as a... Um, outline of the floor with a large hole in the middle and you are now filling in that hole yeah so the obvious question is why wasn't the whole thing in a one piece to start with because the kit design is tight <laughs> <laughs> the center of the floor contains you can't see that can you contain all this lot oh i see yeah yeah, yeah. and yeah. uh it always annoys me when you're building a model and especially when you want it to be reasonably detailed and everything um, and the you know the, the it's, it's money saving isn't it and penny pinching now of course the, the uh, anybody here who is a kit designer and everything and uh, a manufacturer will be up in arms about this because they'll be going yeah 
but you don't want to pay the money. Um, yeah, I guess not. I guess not. Some people don't need the detail or don't want the detail that I want to put in my models. Um, um, but um, I, uh, I think, I think that it's a, in some cases it's a false economy um, because all I'm going to do is to come is is, is going to have to spend time putting a floor in to the model to uh, to make it to make it right. I need something flat to test this on, and I'm not lifting it over here, so I'm going to drop this down and make sure that this is nice and flat. It's not bad. It's not bad. It just needs a little bit of a tweak, but um, there's still a couple of bits to, to solder on here. Um, now that I've got this mostly, mostly soldered in place, um, what's the benefit of resistance soldering over using a conventional soldering iron? Um, in my view, it's a lot cleaner. It's a lot neater. You don't spend hours and hours and hours cleaning the job up and scraping it and all the rest of it. Um, it's, it's a much cleaner way of, of building it. I mean, if you look at, it's very shiny, isn't it? There you go. If you look at that, there is no solder to be seen there. There is on this on the other side, but there's very, but not that much. There's a little bleb of solder coming through here. But I just think that it's a very clean way of soldering. Now, doing it for soldering up the chassis is one thing, but if you're adding detail to a model, if you've got really tiny little pieces that you want to join up, so this is the best tool. Because this thing, you 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 have to uh, heat it up, remove the iron, and let it cool. So then, while it, while you move it away, everything moves slightly, uh, unless you're holding it in place, or unless you're an octopus. But what I find is that if I you know, I can use this, I can hold this here. It's now hot. And now I take the uh, take the probe off. I don't need to take the probe off. So I take my foot off the button under the floor, and it cools down. So this actually holds the job in place, um, which I think is a invaluable way of of helping to assemble a, a model. Right. The uh, the other advantage, of course, um, no agile is that electrically it's much more economical because you're only actually using electricity whilst you're actually making the soldered joint. Whereas an iron, a conventional iron, is switched on probably for several hours. And for 90% of the time, it's not doing anything. And, uh, and as apart a York... From wasting, apart from uh, wasting electricity. Uh, and being, being a Yorkshireman, I can see the benefit of that. <laughs> Ian has just asked the question, is the body of the vehicle screwed to the underframe? Or is that soldered as well? It will be screwed. Um, the instructions Ian, for this kit are very basic and they're in Czech, which is even worse. Um, and um, I have decided that it will be removable. Um, so here, here's one I prepared earlier. And uh, yeah, I've, I've made, made some, uh, made some, I used a bit of uh, quarter inch, uh, quarter inch brass and I've screwed through there and tapped it and you can actually um, no 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 don't fall you can actually um, yeah it, it will screw together um, that will help with painting of course it will help with keeping everything clean and it will help with putting the detail in um, I always try to make it so that you, these things are removable um, how do you put the glazing in if it's if it's all screwed together, all um, soldered together? Um, the trick, of course, is to make sure that the body and the chassis all all join up nicely and don't warp and don't distort and give your you know make the model swallow the model. Um, I guess everybody's got their own way of dealing with those things. So yeah. But yeah, it will be screwed. And the here, here is a, something that I prepared earlier. Yeah. This is um, windows. This is a uh, a, a sprung sprung chassis which will go in there. This one I haven't put the springs on yet, but this will this will sit underneath and 
this will screw to this steel, uh, this uh, nickel silver plate as well. So everything will screw together. Uh, if you are getting your model painted, if either professionally or you're doing it yourself, it's always easier to make the bits removable so that you can actually, uh, so it make it easier to paint. That's my, that's my 10 penneth worth if you want. The, um, the more observant amongst us will have noticed that the, the model that you're working on at the moment, Nigel, has a complete solid floor. Yep. Whereas the one that you prepared earlier has gaps in the floor. Is this presumably to accommodate the motor? Uh, no, th th I will cut a hole. Um, I'll cut a hole in, in this steel plate. Let's keep saying steel, I don't know why. In this nickel silver plate to accommodate the motor. The reason why this model is as it is, is because I actually started this about two years ago and I got so far with it and I got frustrated. I got frustrated with it because the suspension, well, not suspension, but the, what, what, they, what they have put as the detail of the suspension unit just didn't look right, which is why I decided to, to make my own springy, springy um, unit here. Um, I didn't like what he'd done in the kit, and uh, I'm sorry, Jan, um, but I didn't like it. So I took time out to go and have a look at, uh, at these units. Um, I know the depot manager in the uh, town of Poprad. So I managed to go down there and cr was able to crawl underneath and, well, I didn't have to crawl underneath, actually. I just sort of went down in the pit and uh, saw saw the detail that I needed to be able to, to, to create this myself. Um, so that was the idea. That was the idea. Um, and with, so with this chassis that I've got here, um, the one that I've prepared earlier, all of the existing suspension unit will be unsoldered and, uh, and I will solder a, a nickel silver floor in as well. Um, I just think it will be better that way. I think it will also make it easier to attach it to the body of the of the uh, of the rail car. I've just noticed, incidentally, we have two new um, participants who I've just admitted. Oh, and we've got Robin coming along now, so I'll just admit him. Um, I'm sorry if I kept you waiting in the waiting room for any length of time. Any, uh, I've only just noticed that you were sitting there waiting to be admitted. So apologies for that. But welcome anyway. Carry on, Nigel. Hello, Robin. You can't you can't talk to me, but I can talk to you. I've been I've been singing uh, the praises of the Keith Three Seven Millimeter Group. <laughs> so uh, you've had your plug, um, Robin, as well as being a uh, an area representative. Um, He's been my friend for rather a long time. <laughs> but he's been very disappointed that I'm building a, a Slovakian rail car and not a, a nice, uh, nice northeastern locomotive. But this is what I was asked to do, so this is what I'm doing. You could, uh, always, you could always paint it in northeastern green, I could Nigel. Do. I could do. It's nothing like being prototypical. Um, found a bit I missed. See, you go talking and and you miss stuff. Um, so, Robin, who has joined us, uh, and everybody else, welcome. Ro Robin has done a very interesting presentation about coach building. This is a coach of, with a motor underneath it, so. I should really have watched his video and uh, his presentation to understand what I'm doing wrong here. Um, hopefully it will be okay. Right, so, ta-da, we, we have a bit of a chassis coming along now. So the underframe is, is coming together. And we'll just give it a quick clean up. Going back to the, the uh, 
a flux thing, I tend to uh, tend to bung these into the washer after a modelling session. So at the end of today, this will go into the dishwasher. Um, and hopefully Jana, my wife, won't see it. Mind you, it'll be cleaner than the plates. <laughs> right. Etch kits tend to have etch lines in them so that for, for bending, which this does. Um, some need a bend, bending bars or, or whatever to uh, to allow it to uh, to bend nicely and neatly. Another trick that I use is to run a scribe I was using that scribe for something else last week, which, which I'm using a tool not for, for its purpose and it needs uh, it needs sharpening. So I'll run a screwdriver down here instead and by running a screwdriver down there it just starts the bend. You don't want to press too hard, or you, especially if it's a sharp screwdriver, you go all the way through it. But um, it should be Okay. Let me see if this camera's come on now. Ta da! Is that in focus, folks? David? Yeah, perfectly. Wow. So, what I'm doing now is I'm just bending. Bending up the chassis here so that there's this this angle, this angle piece. That's a really bad bit of soldering. Um, some people would call it Mr. Blobby, wouldn't they, Robin? So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to fold these so that. These are all square and nice and ready to to assemble. See, I'm talking about this multitasking thing. I can't talk and bend metal at the same time. I'm sure there must be other questions which um, people are wanting to ask you, uh, Nigel. And just to remind everybody that if you do want to ask questions, you've got the chat facility down the bottom of your screens. And if you just click on that and type in a question, uh, I shall see it and then I shall, uh, I shall ask Nigel to uh, respond accordingly. There we go. So, all very close and close working, close detail for you. Can I make that? You'll go out of focus for a second, folks. That's nice and sharp. Can I see that? Yeah, that's nice and sharp. Um, so what I've done, So I've just um, just folded these up, and one of the good things about this is that by folding it, it will add strength to the model. Um, so and stiffness, and when I'm happy with the angle that it is at a right angle, um, which it appears to be, I will I'll run a fillet of solder. Down that, down the, down the joint, and that will that will just hold it in place, and it will stiffen the model up. And we will pray that it's all nice and square and uh, and flat. I hope after seeing watching this is that you all go away and do some modelling. Um, I think that's part of the the thing, the purpose of this this whole 
live demo is to inspire people to go off and do it or to do stuff, do stuff properly. If I've done something wrong, you better tell me. We're always here to learn new tricks. The eye is always a good way to see if something is square and true. This is quite thin gauge brass as well, so it's very easy to, to bend. And there are some parts of this kit where the etch was, or the etcher has etched a little bit too much out. So it is a little bit uh, like handling tinfoil. But once it's soldered together, it's, uh, it's not bad. All right, so there's a bit, of a bit of a string in that. So that needs a bit of <clears throat> a grunt to get it square. It's, it's coming down, it's coming down there. Good. Just as a matter of interest, um, Nigel, what, what degree solder are you using? Is it standard, um, you know, 185 is it, or is it, is it the low melt version? I'll go back to, oh no, I switched the picker off. That's no good. Come on. You can tell me, David. <laughs> I don't know what. I'm not looking at it, I'm afraid. <laughs> it is low melt solder. I bought it from a very nice man in Kettering a few years ago. Oh, in that case, <laughs> it's, it's 145 degree. It's 145, um, there you go, folks. And it's leaded as well, so you'll be able to, you'll be able to poison yourself with that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. When this these regulations came out about using lead-free solder, everybody went bonkers about it in the model world, didn't they? But I think lead, lead solder is still pretty widely available, though, isn't it? It is. I think the legislation was aimed at. Um, the sort of, what shall we say, mass producers of electronic equipment, yeah. compu computers and television sets and things like that. Um, I think modelers, if you're using it for your own consumption, I don't mean consumption in the what you, what you just demonstrated, but um, for your own use, I think, you, you know, you, we're, we're quite... Okay. Within, within the law to use it. Well, I mean, otherwise they wouldn't, they wouldn't still produce lead is solder. Well, exactly. As, as, a, as a price of, I've got so much of this stuff that I don't know, but has the price of, uh, sol of leaded solder gone up just because it's not produced? Um, I don't know. I, don't, I haven't bought any for a long time, so I wouldn't know, uh, Nigel. But, um, uh, but yeah. But this has been on the go since March. So um, when you're resistant soldering as well, you apply the solder that you need and the rest of it stays on here and it doesn't get scraped off like mm. you would do if you were using one of these ones. Um, I think they all have their place. So they'll be, they'll be as well. Cool, what do I do with my... Uh, I need this again now. So the idea of this is that I'm now going to just run a little fillet of, um, of solder along and try and uh, get this to seal up nice. I've done it again. I switched the bloody picture off. I wasn't going to be changing this, chopping and changing this all the time. And I've got two cameras. In fact, I, I, I was going to have five cameras, but I decided I'm going to have to use two cameras here and the, and the one off the, off the laptop. And um, I ordered a, uh, some new cables uh, so that I could have multiple camera system. And they were meant to arrive yesterday. And of course, they didn't arrive, did they? So um, I'm uh, stuck with one camera. And if I want to swap to the other camera over, over there, uh, I have to um, I have to unplug the HDMI cable. Right. So we're now going to do a bit of more soldering. He says. See, 
for the workbench on ability to inability to multitask. Uh, Robin, I'm I'm going to ask you if you'd like to unmute yourself for a minute. If you want to just have a quick word with Nigel and tell him if he's doing it right or not. Well, uh, can you see him there? Nice to see uh, a lovely demonstration from the junior member of our group. <laughs> Where have that, Joe? <laughs> if you remember that from a video we did with Jack Cray, slideshow with Jack Cray, God knows how many years ago. Uh, but <laughs> stop laughing, Doug. <laughs> Is Doug here as well? Oh, God, he's here. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I, do, I don't know why you're modelling uh, Pacer-style rail cars, because we've got the loop still bloody full of the things down in Keithley Station. Mm -hmm. uh, the Worth Valley seem to have bought every single one in the country. I think, to be fair, they're in store waiting to go to other preserved railways. Um, but, yeah, nice to see you modelling at home anyway. And uh, we did a thing this morning on uh, sharing our pictures of our various workshops and what equipment we had. And it's uh, interesting looking at yours as well to say, we all have very similar workshops. And I said, the one thing that you must never do is decorate your workshop and tidy it because you will never find anything again. All right. There, there, is, an old, there is an old saying in the uh, engineering uh, trade that a tidy a tidy bench is a sign of a sick mind. Yes. <laughs> That's true. Um, this uh, this uh, this work area also uh, doubles up as a uh, as the company office uh, during lockdown. So uh, I have to keep it tidy because my main business partner is the wife, and I get told off if I haven't kept it tidy. But um, but modelling benches, I said to Robin, you'll, you'll know this as well, is that what happens to a, uh, a modelling bench is you have it all tidy and then within about 10 minutes you're working in an area of about, well as I am now, nine inches by four inches and the rest of it is covered in, in stuff. So uh, yeah, <laughs> that's where I am now. Uh, we have a visitor here from... New Zealand, he's staying up late. What's the time in New Zealand now? Are they 12, 13 hours ahead? So it must be one o'clock, half one in the morning. Stick your thumb up if it's half one, Dougie. Douglas isn't listening. No, half 12. I'll, I'll, unmute, you. I'll unmute you, Dougie, so you can have a quick chat with, um, with Nigel. So, Mr. Hay. Hello, can you hear me now? We can I, indeed. I can hear you. How, how are you doing, yeah. Dougie? Oh, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm not getting much sleep because of you. Uh, it's actually 12.39 a.m. here. 12.40 now. <laughs> and I'm intrigued with that huge fiberglass cleaner that you've got there. I want one of them. I've never seen one as big as that. Matron, <laughs> um, where did you get it? I don't know. You don't know? All oh, right. Uh, squires, probably. All oh, right. Yeah, well, they do have a shop in New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> I can put in your um, in your um. No, nobody has a shop in New Zealand selling modelling stuff. Yeah, that's the problem, isn't it? Um, yeah, I think that came from Squires. Uh, right. Well, we have to advertise on the uh, on this whole thing. I don't know. I'll, I'll have a look on their website. See if I can see one. Is this you put a splash of water in that gin? Say again, Doug. Did you put a splash of water in that gin? <laughs> I did. I wish there was. It's lunchtime now. It's 12.41 where I am. Everybody else is up still sort of starting the day. Um, so nice to see you, mate. So that's, we've got, got a visitor from New Zealand. So that's, that's nice to see. <laughs> I think we'd got you booked to um, 
stop for lunch at 12, was it, um, Nigel? I can't remember. Um, Can I stop when I get hungry? <laughs> no, there must be, a, it must be in the thing. Um, well, we've got, we've got to have a half hour break because this, um, these meetings are being, um, these presentations are being recorded, of course, and I've got to send the recording or instigate the record, recording uh, to the cloud, whatever that means. Um, so I'm doing it in two, two batches. So when we stop for lunch, I shall record or send the recording off for the first half. And then when we resume again, um, we'll start recording for the second session. Okay, okay. Um, Dougie, before you, before you go, because I know it's your bedtime, um, uh, I've, I will place an order for those wheels for you. Good lad. <laughs> Good lad. So, um, yeah. as, as I've told everybody already, is that I, I don't normally do this. I normally model in Northeast, and Dougie has a beautiful model railway of Whitby, which I hope will appear in the Gazette at some point. Um, um, but um, he, we're all modelling Northeastern Railway, and we've bought a, what's the kit made by? What, the, the W class? No, not the W class. Oh, there's Robin's got showing off his W class. Um, it's a B, B class, which is an N8 or N9. Bloody yeah, it is B, B class, yeah. Yeah, so we've got, we've got a couple of those to, to build. So uh, we all tend to mass produce them. So we've got uh, Northeastern Railway layouts in New Zealand. There's, uh, there's Raven Spec at Keithley. Uh, sadly missed Runswick Bay, which has gone on to pass as new, and uh, and hopefully next year I'll have a bit of northeastern in the garden next year, <laughs> with a with a Czechoslovak modern image 1973 built uh, diesel rail car to boot. So uh, yeah, right. I better get back to getting on with this, otherwise we'll get to lunchtime and we won't have anything to show for it, will we? Um, just right. before I, just before I do uh, mute you again, Dougie. Yeah. Um, in fact, I've lost you. Where are you? Oh, I'm still here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you, but I can't see you at the minute. Oh, there you are. Yeah. Um, for what it's worth, in fact, this apply. You know, I should mention this to everybody. Of course, um, we should be doing hopefully another one of these sessions. Um, given the current situation which is not li likely to um, be lifted for well in the foreseeable future the next Gajo Guild show which should have occurred in March which of course is the Kettering show of which I am the manager um, that we've had to cancel and there is every likelihood that it'll be replaced by a virtual show such as this so if you want to include your layout Dougie if you've got the facility for doing some taking some video of it and um, you know letting us have it then you, you can appear on the uh, you can appear on the virtual show or your layout can appear almost as if you were at an exhibition with it how about well, that i'll bear that in mind uh, i mean i i'm not the world's best cameraman that's the problem let the trains let the trains do let the trains do the talking. <laughs> I mean, given that we had an ex we had a layout at Telford a couple of three years ago from Australia, came over at enormous expense. This way, we're doing it, you know, for nothing. So, you know, we can have layouts oh, all over the world. Bob, I'm not from Yorkshire, um, Dave. <laughs> sorry, sorry, Nigel. Are you sure you're not from Yorkshire? <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Well, about that, but I, I'm, I'm not really equipped for uh, for for doing much in the line of filming. I, I, I have got a YouTube video on my railway on, but it's all slightly out of focus. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, not to never worry. mind. We'll we'll have a think about that. Anyway, I'm going to bed. I've seen enough of you a lot. Right. So uh, I I'm going to turn in. <laughs> <laughs> you just need to adjust your lights a bit, Nigel. I'm just getting a bad reflection off your head. That's it. Catch you all later. Bye-bye. All, all the best.
<laughs> See you later, Doug. <laughs> <laughs> So you've muted me. I haven't you, muted you, Nigel, have I? I hope. Uh, no, I was muted. I, I suddenly saw something up on the screen, but like I say, multitasking. Right, so that's the two sides soldered up nice and strong, sitting nice and square. Um, I'm not going to solder the ends yet because uh, there's other bits and pieces to go in there. But um, hurrah! We've actually made a bit of progress this morning. Um, this afternoon I'll be fitting the, assembling the uh, battery boxes and engine housings and all the, all the rest of it that go underneath here. And then maybe we'll get the drill out and we'll start fitting, uh, fitting the, uh, the sprung underframe and everything. I'll have a think on about that um, while I'm having my lunch. Um, <clears throat> so how are we doing here? Have we got plenty of participants at the moment or have we bored them all to death? Well, there's 10 of us left still. Yeah. Oh, there we go. It's not the 500 that I was, uh, I was dreading. <laughs> Andrzej Grabowski. Are you in Poland or are you in the UK? Put a P for Poland. No, you can unmute yourself. No, no. Hello, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm in Bangkok. In Bangkok? Yeah, that is, that is why for me uh, it's five in the clock already. <laughs> oh, cheers. <laughs> I could be in Poland too, uh, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I see the Poles drink in the morning. <laughs> I know, so do Slovaks. Uh, where, where in Poland are you from? Well, actually, I'm uh, I'm I'm Dutch since the last oh, six Dutch. generations. So okay, I've I've been in Poland once. Uh, I must say it's exciting that you live in the Slovak in Slovakia. Yeah, I, I like that area very much, but at the moment I'm bound to Bangkok. You're bound to Bangkok, so we live here. Uh, yes, point this way. Um, about 10 kilometers, no, but less than that. Yeah, say 10 kilometers this way is the Polish, is, is the Polish border in the middle of the High Tatra Mountains. So uh, It's a very, very nice uh, area. And I think if you just hop over the border to the Czech Republic, then you're not far from Kovap. Yeah. Which is in, uh, you heard about Kovap? No. Kovap is in, in, in an old factory from the 1950s where they still make uh, make tin plate and things like that. Oh, okay. okay. And I'm, I'm very fascinated with this area. They have an, a, a, a Lito machine. Um, I'm a manufacturer of model trains okay. at Darstadt. And we also have a line of three rail. And my three rail products are, of course, core scale. So I'm now seeing if I can make in the Czech Republic some Lito printing. And these Kovap guys, they have an, a Lito printing machine. Uh, I forgot the name. Yeah, a, 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 Mer a Merkel Bach or something like that. Okay. And it's German from 1942. <laughs> so I wonder what war booty that must have been. Something probably from Upper Silesia or something like that. Maybe. And that thing is still working. Yeah. And it's a wonderful machine because it has wooden rollers. And I don't know if you are acquainted with Lito printing, but if yeah. you have these modern machines which do 5,000 sheets in a minute, exaggerated, and there's one mistake in it, then when you stop the machines, your 10,000 sheets you can throw away. Well, this machine, it goes very slowly. And if there's a little blob of paint, which comes in the ro wooden roller, you had the pop plop plop you stop the machine and you check away 10 sheets and you carry so, on so i like very much its old-fashioned way of doing things which however very high technology uh, minded people which are in uh, in slovakia and the czech republic and that's why i like it so much because they, they make uh, it's like the british a little bit they won the war with paper clips yeah 
So yeah, it's, yeah well, well, you know, they needed a new Spitfire. So they had an um, 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 uh, engines available. So they made the Spitfire 10 inches longer. Bang. And they won the Battle of Britain. Yeah. I mean, this, <laughs> these are sort of brilliant, technical-minded sort of things. And that is why the Russians had a T-34 and they won the war on the East Front. So, uh, yeah. uh, Andres, can I, can, can I ask a yes. question? Are, are you connected with the Darstead company? I, I am Darstead. How are you? All oh, right. Yes, well, I've seen your products. Yeah. Good. Thank you. I hope you're pleased with them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's why I'm interested in, uh, in Nigel's uh, soldering adventures. <laughs> because actually in our factory, when we have to solder something, we make our own solder. Wow. But I see you don't have to do that. No, I bought mine. <laughs> it's quite good. Yeah. Um, that I, that uh, I would suggest that I would suggest is extreme modelling when you have to make your own solder. Well, it's a, it's a, it's a question of speed of production because you can't have one soldering part and then the next one and the previous one falls off. So you need three or four solders. Uh, which have different melting temperatures. Yes, of course, yeah. yeah. So you start with the highest one. So if you make it in, in batches and you mix it accordingly, then it can move along yeah. the production line. Every hops, 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 and nothing falls off. <laughs> but uh, so, solving is always a mystery. So I like to see what tips. And I, I, I like this, uh, what Nigel said about resistant soldering. Uh, which I uh, which I never seen before. I heard about it and I said, well, you know, must be something fancy. But now I have seen it working. Only uh, my question was, but I didn't want to interfere in the workings. Uh, don't you get electrocuted? Uh, well, I guess if you leave... How my... many volt is that thing? Yeah, it's only about... Because only about... basically it works like an electric chair. Yeah, basically yeah. it looks like electric chair. It's but it, it's basically it's like welding. Four or six volts usually. It's like, it's like welding. Uh, ah, okay. So yes, okay. you know, but if you want, and you, want you, you can generate that energy with four to six volt. How many ampere must it be? Sixty. Something like that. Uh, it's, not, it, there, probably, there's three it's quite. Ones. It's quite. Oh, sorry, Twenty. Sorry, Nigel. It's quite high current, but it's. High it's current exaggerated by the fact that the current is being concentrated at the point of the tip. So that's that's where you get the maximum heat. Yes, yes, yes. Because, yes. It, because the, the, the small diameter of the tip creates a huge resistance and therefore you get a concentration of current in a very, very tiny area, hence the right. heat. Uh, Nigel, what, what output is written on that thing? Nothing. Oh, okay. It must be Slovak then. It, it's, <laughs> it must be Russian nineteen fifties. They keep it, it secret. It, it, it's a um, it's a cottage industry. These things. I oh, bought okay. this. This must be Robin. Robin old body is about twenty five years old. Twenty five years old. So, and I've had it all this time. This is very dusty. It's <laughs> pre. It's pre CE mark. There's not yeah, pre C mark pre everything, um, but but this this thing works. I mean, I, I keep thinking, oh, I should get a new one, but all I really want is a new probe, um, and I'll have to make one. Uh, this this probe is slowly splitting, and I don't know if you can see it there. It's slowly splitting and falling apart, but um, it's uh, but it works really really well. It's a good system. It's it's a miniature version of spot welding which is used in industry notably in the in the car industry yeah. where you have a, a high concentration of current in a very very small area which has the effect of welding in the case of car making steel it, it welds it literally welds the two things together who's got the phone on <laughs> that's me sorry it's it's my co-host um, calling me your co -host. um so uh I was about to say, uh, Nigel, it being almost 12 o'clock, um, we did say that we would have a half hour break at 12 o'clock. So um, unless anybody has any 
urgent questions that I'd like to ask Nigel before we stop for does. lunch. Robin sticking his finger in the air, Mr. Taylor. Hang on, I'll unmute, I'll unmute you, uh, Robin. And uh, and Ian has something to say as well. Yeah. Right. Hi, uh, uh, your probe welding rods. Yeah. Yeah, go to any welding suppliers. They do the carbonized, well, copper coated carbonized rods. They use them in welding. What do they use? Uh, and I think it's stainless steel welding from memory or aluminium welding. Uh, it's one or the other anyway. But they are, they are a specialized rod. So, but if you go to a proper welding rod suppliers, if not, next time you come over, I'll give you some. Well, I've, yeah, I, I don't know if it's for welding or for cutting. Because there's no metal in there, is there? Yeah, well, it's copper coated, but it's carbon rod and carbon conducts electricity. Yeah, but, but yeah. Because normally with, with a welding rod, it's, it's a bit of metal. You, go, you, you consume it. I can see Andreas wants a word, but um, really the resistance soldering, being an electrical engineer, uh, we used to get fires in high current, large control panels, 415 volts and above. And if you get a loose connection, you create heat. And in, and in effect, that's all that the resistance soldering is. The carbon touching your metal is a poor connection. And so that's the point where heat's created. So, and that's that's basically how it works. But it works on current, and you vary the current, not the voltage. You vary the current from, on well, on the one that Nigel has shown you, I've got the same one at my feet here. Um, it varies, I think, from 15 amps up to 40 or 45 amps. There you go. Uh, positions one, two, and three. And in our gauge, most of the time, it's on position three. I think Nigel will probably agree. Yeah. Uh, that's that. Am I, am, I right, am I right in saying... Uh, um, Robin, that the voltage is only about four or six volts. It's isn't it? Four volts. Uh, we, we actually measured it. Uh, well, Nigel knows Bruce Clark in Ulkley. Again, a very, very old Guild member who's sadly gone blind now, but um, uh, well, uh, through modelling as well, possibly. But uh, he was an electrical engineer and we were doing checks on these years ago, then on checks on the later ones that Nigel and me have got uh, to see if we could make them ourselves being Yorkshiremen. There'd be a shortcut round it and being in the electrical trade, we'd get a transformer and make our own. And we actually got one because it's not voltage you want, it's current. But yeah. those transformers are fairly hard to come by as a freebie. <laughs> yeah, as a freebie. Bruce Clark. Did you want to um, ask, did you want to ask the, something, Andreas? Yes, the, the, the rods, aren't they uh, 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 coal spire lamps? Which are carbon, very, very pointed. They come together, and that's, oh, that's where you get the brightest light from yeah, what you can know. imagine. Yeah, they I know what you mean. Um, I don't, I don't they, they look that. exactly yeah. like that, Nigel. A coal yeah. spire lamp. Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, sorry, carbon spire point. lamp. Yeah, they come we together. I'll, I'll Google it while, while we're having lunch. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. But, but these rods, are, they're, they're like welding rods, but I'm, I don't think they're used for, I think they are used for cutting. I'm not 100% certain, but I'll, I'll check it. Um, but, they, but they are 10 a penny, they're easy to come by. Um, and you normally sharpen them, you can sharpen them with a pencil sharpener ah. to, to create the resistance. But so, Robin, if you want to buy a thing like that, what do you ask for? Uh, you, well, I, I, I just bought these probably 10 years ago, uh, and you get a whole box of them. I think it's about a dozen in a box, and I think it was six or seven pounds. But what's the name of that thing? Um, well, it's just welding rod. I went into a welding, a welding, rod. Okay. welding suppliers, uh, one that sells welding equipment, um, and I took my sample in that I had from the uh, iron that had nearly burnt out, of course. I'd nearly worn it away. And, and we tend to just snap them into short lengths that you need. And you can sharpen the end with a pencil sharpener, but I do, okay. I do it with a Stanley knife. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so gents, uh, they are copper coated gouging rods. Gouging rods. G A U G I N G, gouging. Gouging. Aging. 
gauging, <laughs> gouging, gauging. And what are they? Uh, you know, some students know what they're used for, um, but they work very well for for so for for, the, for this purpose. Right. Anyway, folks, um, hold on. Before you no, hold on, Dave, because yeah, yeah. on the timetable, uh, lunch is twelve thirty. Are you thirty? Oh, yeah. Ah, all right. Thank um, you, pardon. I um, haven't got the timetable in front of me. Timetable in front of me. And okay. carry on. For Andres, um, I'm putting a link on to eBay on the chat box so you can actually look online at how much they are and where you can source them from via eBay. Uh, there we go. I can see it. Um, Ian. Yes. I'm going to make you host. Okay. And I'm going to disappear for uh, half an hour. No problem. So I shall speak to you uh, later. Thanks everybody else for joining in. And I hope you'll come back this afternoon for part two of this wonderful demonstration of Nar Nigel's. Dave, before you go, yes. um, I've got a little poem for you to do with, with, with uh, the electric chair. Considering yep. we're talking all about the, these, um, these uh, resistant soldering iron and the electric chairs. So it's by Spag Milligan. It's the world's shortest joke, uh, sh shortest poem. And it goes, the vault, it's called The Electric Chair. And it's called, it goes, the vaults, the jolts, the end. <laughs> and on that note. You're going. <laughs> so, so have we been going for two hours? Or an hour and a half? Uh, just over an hour and a half at the moment, Nigel. An hour, and a, an hour and a half, I've done that much. I've done a lot more if I wasn't talking, I tell you. <laughs> well, yeah. So I hope, uh, hope that people that are watching this and participating and enjoying yeah. the, uh, the banter as well as, as well as the construction. It's not designed yeah. for a catch-up for, yeah. for everybody, but uh, it is nice to come. I don't know whether um, which me video off. Um, we're, we're going anyway, so... Dave Smith, you got your your yeah, I know. Sound on. I thought he was going to say something bad about me, then. Uh, um, okay, he's gone now. <laughs> he's gone now. Right. So I haven't really done that much, but I guess if I transfer that onto this onto this ear model, uh, no, it won't. It won't work because. It's slightly different construction. Um, right, so we now need to decide what we want to do next. This is the, these, oh, this isn't very good, is it? These are the instructions from this kit. And the first thing you can see is it's, it's all in check. Um, so when I add uh, a set of drawings, this is a very basic parts list. It's really bad lighting, isn't it? Sun's coming through. It's nice and sunny over here today. Um, but that's it. Four, four sides of A4, that's the kit. Um, so I've had to, to, uh, to um, build this. I've had to translate it. So we've got part number one called a plug which you can probably work out that's the plow, which goes at the very front of the, of the, of the, of the models. But um, yeah, it's not, uh, it's not the easiest of things. I do speak a, a bit of Slovakian, but when it's written down, it's a bugger. So I have to translate it. But um, yeah, we, it was all right to do. But it is a fairly simple kit to build, although, if you want it to look the part, you, you, you have to add, yeah, add your own details in. So uh, um, that's what, what I've been doing. And hence, for those that have just joined us, I've soldered a, uh, a base plate onto the kit, which isn't included. Um, and isn't, the kit isn't designed to have it, but I want it and I need it for, for making the, uh, this model progress. Right. Um, should find something else to solder up. I've got everything ready for you. 
was all sitting on a chair and about 15 minutes before this all started, the cap got into the room. Everything got scooted around the bloody workshop. A box. It is part number two, which is called Bedna Baterek Pro Osim Desat, which is battery box for class 810. And for some reason, I didn't fit that before. So I wonder why I didn't do that. Hello, you all right? Right. Let's find something to something nice to assemble. We can do a bit more resistant soldering. Right, this looks good. This is a box with an overlay. So that's this piece here. Sorry, talk amongst yourselves while I get my head into gear. Right. It's very quiet, isn't it? It is. I, I, I'm not sure if Dave saying we were finishing shortly has uh, had people leave the, um, the demonstration early, unexpectedly, but hopefully they'll return this afternoon. This afternoon. So we will be we will be stopping at twelve thirty for a lunch break and then resuming Nigel's demonstration at thirteen hundred GMT. Yeah, you will bear in mind that I am in C E T Central European time, so I'm hungry. <laughs> no, you're Slovakia. <laughs> um, we all had to get up early this morning because my wife wanted to, um, I can't see what I'm doing here, I'm blocking everything that you can see. Um, my Slovakia is doing a global test of every person between the age of 18 and 65. Wow. The big COVID thing. And it's the first time I think it's been done. I don't think anybody else in the world is doing it. So. Slovakia is, is definitely a guinea pig, but, they, but with the cases rising, um, they wanted to they want to test everybody, um, and uh, that's what they're doing. But my wife got up, got us all out of bed early and said we should go and get tested. And I said, well, yeah, we can do, except I've got this modelling thing which you knew all about, and we went round the corner to where the uh, the test station was, and there was a 50 meter queue of people at two meter spaces so i guess it's 25 people waiting and we went, went online and it was saying that there was a, an hour or 55 minute waiting time so decided not to go um my wife has subsequently gone and she's clear good so that's good that's good news um but going back to this covid thing the great thing about it if there is a great thing about it, is the fact that we've been able to do lots of modelling. And uh, I certainly have enjoyed the, uh, the, the modelling aspect of this lockdown and uh, whole situation. I don't drink as much as I do either, so uh, I'm even modelling sober, which is, uh, which is probably no bad thing. Right, so this is part number... I'll tell you what I'm building. It's not the battery box. Oh, this is the battery box. I'm building a battery box for this uh, for this uh, this um, rail car. So uh, I've cleaned I've cleaned up the off the, the fret, cleaned the uh, where it's been joined to the fret. I'm now just scribing driving these ready for a bit of bending tidy workshop knot. Here's the uh, 
This has one, two, three, four, five folds. So the question is, is where do you start? <laughs> I think I start here. You can probably just about see that, can you chaps? And lady? Yeah, can you move further into frame at all, Nigel? Brilliant. That's better. The, um... Although there is a hand in the way, obviously. Sun's coming straight in there, it's blinding me. So I haven't seen any, any messages on here from the chat thing. You don't want to do it like that. <laughs> no, well, and we, we haven't had very many questions either yet so far this morning. Yeah, I was expecting a few more. Right. Maybe everybody knows about the uh, about these things. Right, here we go. Of course, I switched the soldering iron off because I think it will be easier just to put a little dab of solder in in the inside here. It's a very tiny little box, but I'll put a little dab of solder in to start with. And then I'll run it down with a bit with the resistance iron, and you can see how how effective the iron is at keeping everything clean. Either that, or I'll make a complete mess of it, and it'll look horrible. But, uh, I don't know. While this is heating up for two hundred something degrees, I'll look at the goes in front of this it's that bit there it's nice having one you've prepared earlier um, because you don't have to spend your time translating it from from check so this is this he says Being a continental model, I think we should give a plug to the Winchester group and their continental exhibition, which like all the other things has gone the way of, gone the, way of uh, the world and been cancelled. The last event I attended, the last modelling event I attended was, in, uh, was at uh, Kettering. And a week later, the weekend after that, I was I was locked down and uh, and uh, not able to do anything. That's a bit better, isn't it? Oh yes. Yeah, we can see what we're doing now. Right, this. Uh, why are you beeping at me? I think this thing's just about to run out of juice. Um, So, we have 15 minutes to go. So, in 15 minutes, I'm going to get this uh, this battery box assembled. How about that? Good plan. Good plan. I know people say you should apply the, the solder to the metal and not to the iron, but when you're putting a blob in, um, Mr. Blobby, I find that it's easier to, to get a little bit of solder on there. Cheers. I don't think I need to use a resistance sign for this job. It's, um, it's going on quite nicely without needing any... Uh, Resistant soldering. 
Just getting a bit hot now. You're demoing, you want to do something quickly and keep it going, but the metal's getting a bit warm. So I hope everybody's had a enjoyed the rest of the show. I, has anybody been around the um, the other guild exhibits? Have you had a look around here? Um, I haven't today as yet, uh, but I was part of the test team, so I did see some of the show in advance of it being uh, live today. So uh, uh, the the layout. Videos are, should be quite good, shouldn't they? I guess. Yes, I mean we do have quite a good selection of layouts as well for people to go and look at, and of course there are there is Monksbury, which is live during the day, um, and that will be recorded like all the other live demonstrations and posted on the website and online for two weeks. Well worth watching. I don't know if I'll bother watching myself. <laughs> oh, I would. It's quite entertaining. Oh, well, that's good then. Especially to make burn my fingers. There we yes. go. There we go. There we go. I'll put it on the vice. Vice is lot of metal. It will cool down. There we go. Um, yeah. Maybe if I go to the close up, if it hasn't battery hasn't gone. I have got a spare battery. Oh, hello. Yeah, that's there. What's he doing? Oh, I'm going away from that because it looks like it's throwing a wobbly on me. Um, but it's nice and clean. There's no solder showing through there. It's a nice clean joint. It's nice and strong. So minimal amount of, uh, of cleaning up to do there. Just a quick rub over with the very rare big fiberglass brush that uh, one of our visitors wanted. Just tweak that a little bit. There we go. Hot, 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 hot. Uh, right, so we've got a nice little box, which will be sitting under here somewhere. I can't see the slot for it yet, but um, yeah. It's that way around, so sitting in here somewhere. Uh -huh. Um, of course, I have put that dummy floor in, so it's probably mucked everything up a bit. Um, right, and on top of that, there is an overlay, which is a meant to represent the wooden planking or whatever it is to retain the, the batteries. Some people who know me might know my railway preservation background is that been involved with Deltics for years and bit of a plug here, baby Deltic. Um, I'm one of the team, although I'm one of the team in Slovakia, so I can't work on it, um, helping with the recreation of a baby Deltic at Barrow Hill. Um, but it just, or the talk of battery boxes reminds me about how heavy batteries actually are. 
and lugging them through a Deltic locomotive past the up the steps, past the engines, into the middle of the uh, of the loco. They're bloody heavy. And then you have to do a clean lift up to about this height to lever it into a battery box. This this uh, design is a lot better. The, the batteries are just to, just the outside at waist level on the on the model on the real thing. Right, so I shall tin this. Get it ready. Come on, cross here. That's it. Nicely tinned, solder on the floor. And this is where a resistance iron comes into its arm. Because you can sweat sweat it onto the model really nicely. Right, these make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah. Okay, so ta-da, we've got these parts here and they will A little bit of the old fluxy. The surface here has been cleaned beforehand. I'm going to turn the turn the resistance down a bit. And I'm now applying a bit of the old heat. I can feel my fingers getting hot, so I think it's doing the job. You can hear the flux bubbling away as well. It's, you probably can't see that this here, but it is exiting the... That was easy, wasn't it? It's very hot, but for the sake of time, I'll just clean this up a bit so you can. Ta -da! He says, try and get a, get the angle of light so you can see it. But, uh, yeah, we can just make that out, Nigel. Thank you. This uh, webcam on the Mac isn't as good as the uh, as as this camera here, but this camera here is um, the battery is has just about died so I'm not going to switch on to that um, but I've got another battery so after lunch um, we'll, when we finish uh, I will swap the battery over make sure that it's right and then we can um, we can carry on after lunch. Um, has have anybody got any questions before we go? Mr Morgan, Mr Thoralf Nailing. <laughs> no! Are we all in the UK or are we uh, are we abroad? With a name like Thor, Alf, it uh, doesn't sound sound as though you are. Do you want to switch him on here? Yeah, one moment. Uh, hello. Oh, um, good afternoon. Yes. <laughs> Hi. Um, my name is Thorolf and it's a Norwegian name and I'm living in Germany in nearby Hanover. Okay. And uh, thank you for the great idea to show uh, such a live session. And I'm just trying uh, about some, some minutes to have an overview of what you are doing and what uh, tasks uh, there are. And now I'm watching what uh, will interest me. And uh, I'm, I'm just uh, painting some um, platform uh, stones. <laughs> <laughs> But thank you for your idea. <laughs> I will watch and listen. Okay. Watch and listen. It's good. It's good. 
So, Ralph, um, we are breaking for lunch in four minutes. Yes. The session will resume at uh, 1300 GMT, so 1400 Central European time. And do you know Torsten Fryer? No. No, okay. Sorry. Tor Torsten is the guild representative in Germany. Um, so are you a guild member? Um, are you a I'm, member of the Gay Joe Guild? Uh, no, I'm no. a member of the Arga in Germany. Art, you know? Artspo Zero. Yes. Yeah, and, Tor uh, Torsten is a member of the same society as well. So um, okay. I noticed he popped into Nigel's demonstration earlier. So, okay. um, but anyway, if you are interested in possibly joining the guild, we do have members within Germany, Austria, Switzerland as well. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> My pleasure. But it's nice to have you watching us. So we've had, had New Zealand, Bangkok, Bangkok Germany, <laughs> a Norwegian in Germany. We've had a, a Dutchman a in Slovakia. Yeah. <laughs> I tell you, it's, uh, it's interesting how people get around. But, uh, yeah, it's good. Okay, well, not uh, not the biggest amount of progress I've ever made on a, mo on a model, but um, um, that's what I expected. I thought it would be something like that. Hold on. Um, yeah. Pierre from Germany has got his hand up, so I've asked him to unmute. Good afternoon, Pierre. Do you have a question? Uh, thank you very much for visiting your um, exhibition today as well and I'm also from Germany also a member of Arge and that's all I have no question but I'm fascinating from your activity in Great Britain with, uh, um, with, uh, um, with our railway hobby and uh, only I will only send you some greetings and uh, very nice to be participating at your Zoom meeting today thank you very much here, thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we are breaking for lunch very shortly, yes. Yes. but we will okay. be back in 30 minutes time. Yes. And continue. Um, okay. Paul, Paul, um, Paul yes, Morgan. Paul. The, uh, the resistance iron is a MMS, and I think it was called Mignon Model Supplies. It's a very old resistance iron. Um, but you can see, but I've had it for 25 years and it's worked really well. Um, but uh, do you have a resistance iron, Paul? No, not yet, but I'm uh, considering buying one. Yeah. Or um, possibly even, um, um, possibly making one myself, because I think the main part is the transformer. Yeah. Um, I, Robin Taylor, who was on earlier on, he, uh, he was talking about it and saying that the, the transformer is the, thing, is the thing that makes it. And I think it's finding the right transformer. But uh, I could see a good article in the Gazette for this. You could actually manufacture one of these things. So it would be quite useful. Um, I find resistant soldering, I, soldering um, fantastic. Absolutely superb. Um, oh. Here's one I prepared earlier. <laughs> uh, Lovely. The, the entire this model almost entirely has been resist has been soldered with, with a resistance iron. Might be better with that off. Um, so almost everything. So you've got on here on the boiler, you've got these uh, the, these plugs, these cover plates, and and the boiler band tightening whatever's on on, the, on this. And this is a white metal. Um, this is a white metal uh, casting, casting. D, 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 DGH to give them a good plug. It's a white metal casting. And all I've done is I've tinned this part and applied the iron, the resistance iron, and given it a bit of juice. And uh, you don't want to put too much on, obviously, because you'll start melting the white metal. But God, it works well. And, you know, the, there's so little work involved in in cleaning up. Uh, you see a lot of people 
online on Facebook and things like that, building models. And you, you see them build a model and say, and now I'll go away and clean it. <laughs> and, and they go away and they'll be, they'll be with a scratch brush or with a file or whatever. But literally, the, the amount of cleaning up I've had to do on this model is, is negligible. Um, there's probably a, a little bit of solder coming through here. Just a little bit of solder showing here, but but all these parts. This has been this is a white metal part. I put the the resistance iron underneath here, and there's a pedal. There's a button. So I just push the button a few times, on off, on off, on off, and you can gauge when it's about to go. Because if you've tinned the the part underneath here, you can see the solder melting, and then you can just and and you literally you're just varying between. 145, well, you keep it under, you keep it 140, 145. Uh, as soon as you get it hot enough for the 145 solder to melt, um, then, then, then it, and it joins. And it's such a clean method. So I can just, really recommend it, Paul. Just to jump in there, I have a London Road Models uh, RSU. Um, I've had mine for about 22 years now. And I've had a quick online check while Nigel's been talking, and it has a 100 VA transformer as the main power source. 100 watt, in other words? 100, yeah. 100 watt, yeah. So um, I, I can really recommend them. I can really recommend these, uh, these resistance signs. Um, and we'll be doing a bit more resistance soldering this afternoon, I guess. Yeah. I, I do believe um, one of the guys doing the demonstration today is touching on RSUs as well, isn't he? Uh, I think, Dave. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be Rob Bishop. He's doing yeah. a, ded a dedicated demonstration of, of soldering, um, which includes resistance soldering. Um, I don't know. I haven't got the timetable to hand, so I don't know what time he's going to be doing that. Although I think it's a video, in which case you can click onto it at any time. Um, it's a it's a pre-recorded demo, so it should be running all day long. Good. Thank you. The other thing right. is, do you find the tin foil sufficient as an earth, or the the point? Yeah, sorry, I forget. Pick because was that just a sort of later. temporary so, one, just a quick knock up. Yeah, the, the point of this, and this is the original piece of wood that came with the kit with the with the soldering iron. It's a piece of plywood and there is a bolt coming through the top of it and a, and a, and a whacking great big repair washer to make the circuit and every so often you, I would un, I'd undo this and I'd replace the foil. Um, good thick foil like turkey foil, you know, when you're wrapping up your turkey at Christmas, good thick foil is best just because it's a bit stronger but it, it makes a circuit, that's all it's doing, it's making the circuit. I have seen uh, another iron which has got a metal plate, like a steel plate, and people are using rare earth magnets to hold the job in place. I can, I can understand the rare earth magnet, but I can't understand why you'd have a great big thick steel plate uh, to solder to. Because if I've got a great big thick steel plate there and I apply the power, I've got to heat the plate as well. And it seems like it's, it's going to really... Uh, it, it doesn't actually matter, Nigel, because, of course, electricity follows the path of least resistance. So it will, it will still follow a, a, a fine track from where your anchor point is and your probe. So if I've got it set up like this, and I put the yeah. probe in there, but the, 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 the brass plate here that I'm soldering onto is, is next to the steel plate. I... Oh, can I chip in there, Nigel? Yeah, of course you can. If you were to use a steel plate yep. under, underneath your wood which i presume is a bit of mdf is it it's a bit of plywood plywood yeah uh, and then use your foil on top as you've got there you would find that the rare earth magnets are powerful enough to to hold um the workpiece onto your foil by virtue of the fact that they'll they'll go all the way through and, and attract the, uh, the steel plate underneath, but mm. steel plate won't conduct away any of the heat because it's separated by the wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those yeah. those magnets those magnets are extremely powerful, and they will they will go they will travel. You know, the magnetism will pass through 
10 or 12 millimeters thick wood easily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, anyway, is, we, is, we, it, we is, it not, is it not lunchtime, folks? It is lunchtime. Um, let's, have a, uh, let's have a break. Yeah, and reconvene in half an hour. I've drunk a lot of water and tea this yeah. morning as well, so what can I say? I'll see you all in about, uh, in about half an hour then. Okay. Okay, chaps. Thank, thanks everybody for joining. Oh, yeah, Tony, everybody, thanks. So, thanks. yeah, so, yeah, th those of us that are still with us, yeah, we're joining, we're rejoining after lunch uh, at about 1300, 1305-ish. Hopefully see you later. Thank you, guys.